What's happening, model makers? It's time for another update on the Kitmaker Network Dragon 132nd ME 109E4 project. And I am pleased to say that this will probably be the last uh, update or, or video build diary post uh, before I do uh, a, a finished reveal sort of thing. Um, I, I hate the word reveal. I, it's, I feel it makes me think of, of like magic tricks and I'm, you know, yanking back the cloth on something that's supposed to be amazing, but I don't know. I feel weird about saying it that way. Anyway, whatever. Uh, what I'm going to do is go over uh, a few things with the kit um, and close that out. And then once I get this crashed Messerschmitt mounted to a nice grassy base, then I'll come back and show you the finished product. So let's take a look. Okay, so as uh, I said in the last uh, segment that I filmed, uh, I was getting ready to finish adding the wings and everything else. And you can see that not only have I done that, but I am f well on my way down the uh, <laughs> down the path to fully painting this thing. Uh, you know, that thing that wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> Funny how these projects take on a life of their own. Anyhow, before I go any further, there's a couple of quick things to talk about uh, while we can still see the issues. Okay, first of all, sort of the most obvious one is right here around the, uh, around the cannon ports. Um, you can see that that's a little that piece is a small insert there, and it's a terrible fit uh, on both sides, and uh, you'll definitely have to deal with that. And uh, you know, but a little bit of careful body work, and you should be able to get that blended in. Uh, I personally am not going to worry too much about rescribing that line. I don't think it really adds much value and going around the fleeting edge of the wing is more trouble than I feel like dealing with on this, so no big deal there. Uh, I did have a little bit of filling uh, to do uh, on, on the left side wing root just because the gap was still a little too obnoxious, but that was no big deal. I did that with some Mr. Surfacer 1000. Um, Let's see, okay, here is sort of the major issue that I uncovered. Um, and that was when I went to install the windscreen. Uh, sorry, I keep bumping the camera. The back portion of the, uh, of the canopy fit pretty much perfectly. But the windscreen, <laughs> it was one of those things that makes you go, what the heck? Is this part even for the right kit? Um, what you can't see there is that uh, it was about a millimeter too narrow on each side. So basically there was a huge step between that top edge of the fuselage and the bottom edge of the windscreen. And additionally, what you can't see here is that there are a couple of ridges on the top edge of the fuselage that are supposed to uh, align it for you. And I'll show you here in the instructions where those are. Uh, okay, if you look right there, you can see where that arrowhead is, that there's a small ridge there. Now, that would all be well and good if, in fact, the width of the windscreen part. Good grief, I am just abusing the camera this morning. I guess I'm going to have to fire the camera guy and get somebody who's competent. Anyway, um, that ridge would be a, a great alignment feature for the windscreen if in fact it fit, but it doesn't and so the ridges just get in the way. So what I did is I just took a, a sharp knife blade and I just uh, took that ridge off of both sides. Then I put the windscreen on uh, with some uh, Tamiya Extra Thin, which is my favorite thing for installing uh, canopy parts, and definitely was the best choice in this case because I was going to need some strength. Um, 
what I figured out is that this was a fairly easy fix by just putting some clamping force on either side of the fuselage right here. So once, the, once I had this thing positioned correctly fore and aft, then I just put a, a clamp on there and squeezed that in until the edges of the fuselage matched up with the edges of the clear part. And it really didn't take a whole lot of force, uh, even though it had to move quite a bit. Uh, and that saved me from having to do any serious body work. So that's a relatively easy fix, but definitely something to be looking out for. Okay, as you can see, the little 109 looks significantly different than it did the last uh, time we looked at it. And that's because obviously I am in the middle of painting and weathering. Uh, but I thought this would be a good time to talk about a couple of things. Uh, first of all, let's just talk about the prop. You can see that I've assembled it. Uh, it went together pretty painlessly, but uh, even though the engineering is pretty good, you have to pay attention to make sure that you get all the blades oriented the same because there is enough slop in there that you could uh, you could screw that up. So, uh, but that's not too big of a deal. Um, as you can see, this prop is crash damaged uh, from a dead engine landing, so that's why only two of the blades are bent. Um, and that was a little bit of an adventure. Uh, I tried the boiling water trick because I had been assured that it would only take about a minute. Uh, and I don't know if this Dragon plastic has a higher glass transition temperature uh, than regular polystyrene or what. Um, just as a little bit of information, polystyrene's melting point is about 420. But in theory, all you have to do is get it up around the glass transition temperature, which is right around 200, uh, that's the point where it will start to take a plastic deformation. In other words, not spring back. So, in theory, boiling water should be plenty warm enough to allow you to do that, but I just couldn't get the right kind of bend out of it. Uh, which is probably a good thing, because I am an idiot. <laughs> uh, I discovered, um, after I'd already put a little bit of a bend in those two blades, that I bent them the wrong way. <laughs> It's not that blades never get bent forward in a crash, but that's not what I wanted. So I ended up going the, the brute force route and just used my little Dremel torch and very carefully put enough heat on it to not only get them going the right direction, but uh, get what I felt like was a, an appropriately mangled appearance. So hopefully that's all good. Now the other thing to talk about here is the fact that the uh, nose is attached, and that's a, a pretty significant milestone with this thing. Um, when you look at the instructions, you'll see... Uh, actually, let me get those out, and we'll take a good look at the step in question. It's uh, pretty straightforward, but there's a little bit worth talking about. Okay. You can see right here that they act like you're gonna just magically plug this thing straight in to the front of the airframe. And that's um, sort of what happens, but it's not quite that straightforward. If you look at step seven, you'll see that there are some tabs on the ends of the engine cradle, and those have to plug into a socket that is in the inside of uh, this section right here and it, it's, a, it's a little bit of a blind man's bluff game because once this is all put together and once you start putting this on there it's almost impossible to see uh, where those sockets are and to guide um, those two very spindly uh, little uh, little bits into the right spot. Uh, now fortunately if you don't get it exactly right, it's not too big of a deal as long as you've got the two upper engine mounts in the right spot. So what I did is, if you look closely, uh, you can see what I'm talking about here is the, the top two mounts right here. What I did is I got them in place and I, and I super glued them. Then, uh, and, and, and this was after making sure that I was at least in the ballpark with what was going on uh, inside here. 
Um, I knew it wasn't exactly right, but there's enough room in there that if if they don't, if the if the rods don't go into the sockets perfectly, it's it's not it's not going to keep it from going the rest of the way together, as you can see uh, down here. So. What I did then is uh, um, I put some pressure on the spindle and put some super glue in the joint right here and just held on to it until everything was solid. And that seemed to work pretty well. Now, one thing that you'll notice is that there's a significant step in that joint right there. And that goes all the way around. Uh, it is not a perfect fit. And you can see that I've put quite a bit of super glue on there. Um, uh, fortunately, again, because this is a crash diorama, I don't have to care about that because none of it's going to be seen. But if I did uh, care and I wanted that joint to look good, um, that's definitely something that I would have had to have paid attention to. And given that I did all the painting and weathering to this beforehand, that would have been uh, a real bummer. So I think in retrospect that if I knew I were going to build this thing uh, you know, on its wheels, uh, where that uh, underside would be ever be visible at all, that I might have elected to uh, not paint this cowling until after uh, this entire subassembly had been added to the front of the airframe. And I talked a little bit about that before with regard to the difficulties that gives you in painting the exhaust headers. But, you know, this is just one of those things where you have to, you know, pick a strategy and accept whatever trade-offs trade -off, trade come along because there's not going to be a, uh, a perfectly seamless path to, uh, to get it all done. But so far uh, everything seems to be going pretty well and um, we're getting real close to the end of this thing. Okay, I know not a lot of you guys build aircraft with the uh, wheels up, uh, but I just thought this would be something uh, good to know because, hey, you, you never know uh, who might want to want to do that. Um, if you're even thinking about it with this kit um, and you're thinking that you're going to just uh, assemble the gear and tuck them up into their wells, forget about it. It isn't going to happen for you. Not even close. Um, not only do you have to uh, clip the... Uh, not only would you have to clip the uh, top end of the oleo off like I did there, but you'd have to grind down this, uh, this bolster right here enough that it would clear the inside of the door uh, right there at the top of it. Um, and that is once you got the actual opening to the correct shape which you can see you've got a problem with here on the on the back edge but even if you get past all of those issues on that end of the gear you still have this um, the wheel is the, the combination of the wheel and the gear door and the uh, axle and everything is is uh, too thick and the wheel is too large in diameter for it to even recess all the way down into the wheel well. So uh, if you were going to do this, um, you know, about the only way that you could really pull it off is to just forget about the strut altogether, take the wheel, get it to where it would fit down inside here acceptably, then take the door and just glue it on you know, on the top of the opening right here. So again, I know not a lot of people are going to do that. I don't, I, you know, fortunately, I don't have to care about it uh, again because this thing is going to be resting in the grass on its belly. And uh, unless you are a quarter of an inch tall, you're not going to be able to walk under there and see if I have any landing gear installed or not. But I just thought it was good information, something to know about this kit. Okay, I'm getting really close to the finish here. Uh, in fact, this will probably be the last clip before the conclusion. Um, I have got a layer of all clad aqua gloss on top of all of my weathering and paint work so far, which is just about done. And I'm getting ready to put on a layer of Tester's Dull Coat Lacquer. And there are a couple things that were worth mentioning right now. Uh, first, 
you can see that I've got the cowlings kind of loosely in place. Um, a good point to make about this kit is that it's really an either-or situation uh, as far as displaying the guts go. If you want to have it completely closed up, you need to build that way from the beginning. If you want to have it completely open, you need to build that way from the beginning because um, just uh, displaying it with the cowlings on there and then taking them off whenever you please isn't really going to work out that well because the fit is just not that good. So, just something to keep in mind. Uh, fortunately, again, in my case, because it's a crash diorama, uh, everything is going to be in the off position. Um, another thing to take note of is the prop. I just finished assembling that, and I was pretty disappointed in uh, to, to discover that you can see you've got some pins and holes in the back of in this in this base plate that everything attaches to. The prop itself attaches to these three on the inside and then the spinner attaches to the ones on the outside. And none of those really lined up. They just weren't quite clocked correctly. Um, so I just clipped them off and uh, you know did it without them. But, uh, so no big deal, but that's just a little bit of an annoying thing and just the kind of thing that you really shouldn't find on a kit that's as good as this one. Okay, so there you go. Uh, not a whole lot to say about it at this point. Um, you know, there wasn't a whole lot more construction that took place uh, since the last installment. Um, this has all been mostly about uh, about paint and so forth, which really was never going to be part of this video diary to begin with, but as things have worked themselves out the way that they have, uh, there you have it. So, if you've followed along uh, with this whole project, um, I hope you've enjoyed it and found it informative. Um, and that this helps you build, uh, if you know, if you're building this kit or thinking about building this kit, that it helps you. Um, if I haven't said it before, I really feel that overall this is a fantastic kit. Um, there's been some pretty good comparisons done between all of the 132nd scale offerings of the BF109E series. And um, uh, it's pretty well agreed, I think, that this is the best of the lot. And... Uh, overall, I do think it's a very good kit. So, go get you one and have fun. All right, guys? Thanks for watching. Much love.